Coming up on DTNS, whether Netflix is actually in trouble or not, do we want mixed robot-made drinks and smart diapers? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, July 18th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And uh, from the outskirts of the L.A. County Empire, I am the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just having a lovely reminiscence about chewing gum and local brands of soda on our expanded show, Good Day Internet. You can get that by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start this show with a few tech things you should know. The European Commission has fined Qualcomm 242 million euros for blocking British phone software maker Isera, which is now part of NVIDIA, from the market using predatory pricing about a decade ago. This is Qualcomm's second EU antitrust penalty. Now, the company said it would appeal and that the fine is, quote, unsupported by the law, economic principles, or market facts. Wow. Slack sent emails to users it believes were affected by a data breach back in 2015 when attackers gained access to its user profile database, including their scrambled passwords. However, the attackers inserted code that scraped plain text passwords. Slack said it recently was contacted through its bug bounty program about a list of allegedly compromised Slack account passwords, which the company says is only about 1% of users, but they are contacting all users who haven't changed their password since 2015 out of an abundance of caution. Yep, I got that email as well. And, uh, you know, better safe than sorry, right? A few months after Instagram started testing a new design that hides the total number of likes on other users' posts that they've received, the company is expanding the test. Originally, it was just based in Canada, and the test is now rolling out to users in Ireland, Italy, Japan, Brazil, Australia, and New Zealand. Now, to be clear, users with this new design will still see that everyone liked their own photos and videos and have that total number but not anyone else's. Memory chip spot prices rose for the first time this year, 15% for DRAM. Weak demand and oversupply are considered the major factors behind the rise, but a curb on chip making material exports from Japan to South Korea that we've talked about on the show before could make the price increases worse. The spot market makes up about 10% of the market. It refers to immediate purchases versus long-term contracts. Uh, but something to keep an eye on if you're thinking about building a computer for sure. All right, let's talk a little bit more about some nasty apps on Google. Yeah, if you've not heard of stalkerware, it doesn't really have anything to do with malware, (laughs) at least not on the surface. Antivirus company Avast reports that it found seven stalkerware apps in the Google Play Store that had been installed more than 130,000 times. So quite a few times. Google has removed all seven apps over the last couple of days. If you're not familiar with the concept of stalkerware, the app tracks things like location data and provides contact information, call logs, text messages, very, you know, personal stuff. They often build themselves as a way to track children or find lost phones. But the descriptions, if you dig down into some of these apps, involve giveaways like catching cheaters, somebody who is spying on someone else, for example. They require access to the target's phone, but once obtained, a user who installed one of the seven apps would be prompted by the attacker to then install separate software and then delete the initial download, which leaves no app icon and no real trace to indicate that this had happened and the spyware had actually been installed. Yeah, this is this is nasty. Um, so first of all, let's make it clear, uh, apps that are meant to help track your children are fine. Uh, yeah. not, not all of those apps are catching cheater apps. Uh, these specifically, you can tell because their descriptions are different than what the title <laughs> says. Uh, same with find lost phone apps. But the nasty part is that, okay, you're in a combative relationship. Uh, and yet you still have enough trust that they're like, Hey, can I use your phone? Right. I mean, right. that is the situation. Or they just don't have... lock it and they go to the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Something like that. Uh, so while the other person in the relationship has the phone, they could go in, install one of these apps, mm-hmm. uh, install the separate software, have it sent to their email address and then delete the icon. And the other person would never know it was there. It's really bad. Yeah, and the folks from Avast said, listen, this is just unethical stuff. These apps are, are you could use them for non-nefarious reasons, but that's not really what they're being used for. And, yeah. you know, we wanted to bring it to Google's attention and Google agreed. 
Yeah, and Google has removed all seven apps. I, I guess they did like in, in two phases. Uh, yeah. they, they removed a few right away and uh, and then took a while to look at the others to make sure that they were falling afoul because they don't want to be removing a legitimate app that is for child protection or finding your phone, right? Uh, and and none of these qualified for that. Right. Just Just bad stuff. A report from the Paulson Institute in Chicago says that while China leads the way in data depth and access for use by AI, the U.S. has better data quality and diversity. You hear a lot of headlines out there saying China has the lead in AI, mostly based on the fact that it has a lot of data because the government is more permissive in collecting it. People give it up voluntarily in China more often as well. So those two facts combined mean there's a lot of data available for companies to use. China, it does have a lead in the depth of data it has. A lot of that is because there are 800 million Chinese users who have internet access. And uh, it, it has a depth of access because there are high use of services like WeChat. Yeah, some of it is government surveillance. Some of it is just people saying, I use WeChat for everything. And therefore, now they have access to all this information from hundreds of millions of people. However, the US AI efforts are global. Uh, so they're not limited to one country like a lot of the China databases are. That gives US companies access to a greater range of languages, ethnicities, cultures, and nationalities. So that's going to give you a higher quality uh, because you have more room for error control and more diversity in the kind of data you have. Yeah, I mean, that was you know, my first question when I when I when I first was digging into the story was, well, how does the US have more diversity? But it's true. If 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 China and apps that are that are somewhat walled garden Chinese apps that have a lot of data, but still are one region specifically, then you think like, well, I mean, wouldn't the US be the same? But no, I mean, it, it's the apps are used by far more folks. And so you do get that diversity. Yeah, this is uh, uh, this is just a good note uh, to to have when you're hearing the discussions of the of the AI race. It's not as simple as China has more data. So China's ahead. Uh, sure. And both both countries' governments are doing a lot to try to boost uh, their AI development, uh, and I, you know, China's going to have to change a lot of its practices if it wants to get access to data outside of its country. Um, and and the U.S. is going to be battling headwinds of, of access because, especially in Western countries in Europe and the United States, there's a push to limit access to user data right now. So so both countries have their challenges. Both countries also have babies. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, they do. And here's where I'm going with that. Pampers announced its new Lumi all-in-one connected diaper system with two activity sensors for the diapers, a Logitech camera, Wi-Fi baby monitor, and also a companion app. Lumi's sensor detects and monitors a wider, more visible blue strip on the outside of specially made diapers to detect wetness. Now, these aren't the only smart diapers. The Monit Smart Sensor diaper uh, in Korea can be attached to any diaper, so kind of has a leg up, so to speak. The baby cam measures temperature and humidity and serves as a hub for the activity sensor. It is very much a smart diaper. The app takes all this data to then view activity trends because babies are active, let's be honest. No price on the system yet, but it will include two packs of diapers when it launches in the autumn, and you can sign up for pre-orders now. Yeah, tracking baby activity is a huge trend among parents right now as Very a way so. to sort of measure health uh, and 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 sort of track ba uh, infant progress, uh, you know, as, as far as their diet, nutrition and all kinds of things like that. So this is a, uh, a move by Pampers to try to get in on that action uh, a little bit by measuring it. It doesn't do weight. Some of these like diaper changing pads will do, will like weigh the baby every time you lay it down and stuff like that. But it is trying to collect that data and put it in an app, make it easy for, for parents to see. Uh, obviously the one that, that everybody is going to be interested in is, oh, is it's going to tell me when the, the diaper needs changing. changing. That's interesting. Uh, so I don't have to guess, but it doesn't tell you when it's dirty, only when it's wet. So, uh, well, wet sometimes does that. mean dirty. Kind of well, depends no, I'm, I'm specifically using dirty to mean more than just wet. <laughs> it's not going to tell you that. You're still going to have to use the sniff test. <laughs> Even uh, so, sometimes wet and dirty are not mutually. Oh, sure, sure. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, absolutely. But I'm just saying, you're only going to get the wet part of it. And that, yeah. that isn't always all the information you need. <laughs> well, you know, when, when Roger and, and Tom and I were at CES earlier this year, and there have been stuff like this uh, in the past, but we did notice there there was definitely a surge in baby monitoring smart cribs, um, you know, and 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 
uh, uh, you know, uh, cameras that were specifically meant for checking in on your baby and, and could give you more data than just like, oh, is my baby asleep or is it awake kind of thing. So I don't know, Roger, if you feel like this is something that is useful or just a little bit it's, of a marketing I, scheme. I mean, uh, I don't want to poo-poo any of the, <laughs> the stuff that they're doing. <laughs> the data is very valuable. However, in a lot of these instances to, to get the data, you need to strap something to the diaper or you need to set them in a specific place. And after around five or six months, your kid starts booking it all over the place. They're very, they're very um, boisterous. And so, you know, when you're changing diapers, you may not remember to stick the sensor back on or you might not remember to put them in a specific place because right. you're half awake. Just trying to keep up. Place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, it's not that this information isn't useful. I'm just wondering in a long term with a, with thousands of people using this, like there are times where we don't even put clothes on my kid because it's just like, you know, they're going to wet their diaper again and I'm going to have to change it. Might as well just leave it off and then make things. Because <laughs> there, there's a point where you just, I mean, you especially you have two kids, you just kind of like, well, whatever makes things the smoothest. What you're saying is is the trouble of remembering to put the sensor on might not be something or, that- Or remembering to put them in a specific location, you know, like- I don't know that this requires a specific location. Well, for the not. cameras and stuff, I mean, like, you know, do I- There are times where I've changed my kid on my lap or I've just changed it on the chair where it's the most convenient and not necessarily the most- uh, well, the, the camera part isn't about the wetness detection. The camera part is when you've put her, put her down in the crib. Yeah. And yeah. It's letting you do the baby monitor thing. I think well, that's separate. But no, no, that. But, like, with, but even with the diapers, it's like, you know, my kid, will, my kid is going to cry when her diaper's full. Like, this is the thing. To get a full night's sleep, and if she sleeps through it, great. Her diaper's super full in the morning. I'll take it off and I'll swap it. But if we don't have to change it in the middle of the night and it's not giving diaper rash, leave it on. Well, I think it's kind of like, okay, do we wear activity monitors on our own rests at night to to gain some data about how we slept and maybe, you know, how our REM sleep uh, was and see how many times we turned over. But when you're talking about babies, in many cases, the babies will precede that, the data yeah, anyway. That, like, they, that, like the kid's stuff, already crying, like that, she's up. That, and this stuff is pretty pricey. Like yeah. uh, around, around six, seven months, you know, there's a whole set of metrics, you know, if you've never had a kid, you you don't realize how fast they grow. Like you think, like oh, they're an adult. They'll never, you know, you might gain weight a little bit, but once you've grown, you've grown. But with kids, there's this growth spurt, growth spurt, growth spurt, and then I'm I'm tossing out the crib next month because mm -hmm. she's too big for it. All right, folks, if you have thoughts on this feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Meanwhile, Aunt Pruitt brought to our attention uh, the story that Amsterdam is pausing approval of new data centers until the end of the year in order to adjust the city's policies uh, because Amsterdam thinks it probably has more data centers than any other major city in the world. Uh, part of that is due to low taxes. There's also cheap electricity, sustainable electricity. And the city worries that it is putting too much strain on its power networks as well as affecting the property market. Property values in Amsterdam are going through the roof. Amsterdam is, in fact, home to about a third of the data centers in Europe. So it's no joke. There's a lot of data centers there. A lot of companies, Google, Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, have data centers in the Amsterdam area. The government wants to give municipalities more control over location and making sure that new construction fits in as little space as possible, as well as blends in architecturally, and while data centers run on 80% green energy, Amsterdam wants to do more and wants to set requirements that data centers make residual heat available for free so that people in Amsterdam can use that for heating their homes or other green energy uses. Uh, something that a lot of the data centers are doing voluntarily already. And a lot of the data centers are upset about this pause because they wanted to put some more data centers in development. Existing data centers being developed will be allowed to continue. They're just putting a pause on approving the new ones. But, you know, companies don't like that. First of all, God bless the Dutch. Uh, second of all, the fact that Amsterdam is home to about a third of all of Europe's data centers if you haven't been to Amsterdam recently, wonderful town, not that big. That is that is that is a high concentration of data centers in in one place. So I can definitely see where those cities like 
hold on a second, might, you know, we might have been giving a few more incentives and we have to rethink this. I happen to have a friend who uh, writes for a, a newspaper, a local newspaper in the Netherlands. And I said, is, you know, is this something that, you know, people are up in arms about? And she said, eh, most of the, most of the public is not talking about this. So, you know, it's definitely still more of a tech story and might, might be getting a little bit more attention in other places such as here. But, uh, but yeah, I, I wonder where, okay, if Amsterdam puts a uh, clamp down on the, the, the very, uh, attractive situation that data centers have enjoyed thus far, who's the next city? Well, I, I, I tried to look up some stats on that. It seems like Germany is, is, is a home to a lot of these data centers. So, so maybe somewhere like Berlin um, or, 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 yeah. or, or somewhere uh, in Germany, but, but yeah, it doesn't sound, I, I don't think Amsterdam is clamping down. I think what's happening is Amsterdam's like Amsterdam saying, look, we love getting all these data centers, but it's starting to become a problem. Sure. Uh, so we just need to put a pause for the rest of the year and figure it out how to make it not a problem. We're not going to take away the tax incentives. We're not going to charge more for our electricity, but we are, we do want to put in some requirements that keep Amsterdam livable. And I think that probably makes sense. Mm -hmm. There's a trickle happening and they want to stop a flood. They have a lot of experience with that sort of thing. Imagine if San Francisco was like, Hey, <laughs> We need we need to maybe, you know, not keep this flood of data centers going on and make sure that they blend in architecturally. You just wouldn't hear that. I mean, I I, I actually think I could imagine that in San Francisco, but what would happen here is they'd just go to San Jose. So <laughs> they'd be like, well, see you later, San Francisco. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about food at Food Tech Live at CES. I mentioned CES a little bit earlier on the show. We also saw several automatic drink makers. They are exactly what they sound like. Barsys 2.0 is one of those drink makers launching adding Bluetooth for up to three devices at a time and some machine learning to help drinks consistent, making drinks consistent. Barsys 2.0 will be available on July 22nd for $1,500. So not super cheap, probably not going to put it in your home, but might be better targeted at bars that want to save money on those bartenders with a heavy hand and, you know, keep things consistent. Drinkworks Home Bar sells for $299. That's another option. But the question is, do people care whether a drink is made by a machine or a human? Yeah, I mean, $299 is a lot for me to spend to make this at home. I'm definitely not spending $1,500. So that's got to be a restaurant thing. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know how y'all feel. I don't mind in some cases if my drink is made by a machine. It depends on what I'm ordering. If I want a, a gin and fresca, then I just say, you know, it's made by a machine. That's fine. Uh, I'd rather have it made by my friend Dave because he's good at it. But, you know, it's not complicated. However, if I'm like, ooh, uh, I know this bar where they just make the perfect Manhattan. I mean, theoretically, a robot could mix it the same way. But I don't know if I maybe I'm silly not to trust it. It's all about proportions and the amount of of mixing and the order of ingredients. I guess a robot could do this. I, yeah, it's I, all about portion control. Uh, having having received a number of restaurant magazines, when you're in the restaurant industry, you get magazines whether you signed up for them or not because they just want you to read the ads. But all of them, number number one or two item in their in their in their advertising is portion control. How do I maintain portion control? Because that is 50% of your business. If you can keep your- You're not saying control. what makes a good drink is portion no. control. You're what saying- the, What the, the, the appeal- The robot bartender yes. is the restaurant owner having control over how much liquor is being yeah. used in each- Basically so time. that the bartender doesn't make a drink too strong. Yeah. Right. So, and you know, they even have- I don't know if you ever, when you go to a bar, you look at the tip, they have those pourers. There's a little ball in there that limits how much you comes out with each pour because that was something that someone came up with in the 60s for Porsche control. So this is where I see this uh, being most effective is restaurants who don't want an actual bar but still want to serve something more than just beer, but not necessarily like we have a huge selection of wine. You just want a cocktail with, you know, your lunch. Uh like my, uh, like I know people or, or some people are inclined to do. I, I, I am not a license. big mixed drink drinker. Um, so mixology, I understand. And I'm using air quotes because that's just the term that you hear a lot. I know that that, that is a real skill and it matters. And yeah, I, I would never say, oh, well, people who are super skilled should just be replaced by robots because it's all, you know, a matter of just, you know, 
liquid and making sure that your your portions are are correct and then you get the perfect cocktail. However, I personally would not care if a robot or a person made my drink. Sure, the bartender Dave, if I like the guy, you know, give him a tip. Uh, you know, happy to happy to chat at the bar for a second, but. Otherwise, this makes perfect sense. The, yeah, I think the robots are pretty good listeners too. Yeah. Although the best bartenders <laughs> They don't the argue ones, with you. The That's best bartenders sure. are the ones that keep the conversation going. That I've seen at least from the t- uh, from their tips. Man, chart. I've I've had some bad bartenders. Yeah, you can tell Roger doesn't drink. Uh, <laughs> if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. All right, yesterday we uh, mentioned that Netflix reported it added 2.7 million subscribers last quarter, about half of the 5 million it expected. In the United States, it lost 130,000 subscribers, the first drop in subscribers since 2011, which was back when it split DVDs and streaming apart. Uh, The company noted it saw it missed its forecast by wider margins in areas with price increases. So they're saying it looks like price increase definitely had an impact on uh, us missing our forecast. Netflix also says its original content in Q2 drove less growth than it had anticipated, and it's still hopeful for next quarter. Netflix expects to add 7 million subscribers in Q3. They expect to bounce back and add 800,000 subscribers in the U.S., and Netflix also announced it plans to introduce a lower-cost mobile-only plan in India within the next three months. If that happens within Q3, then that could help boost some numbers in India, which is a huge potential market uh, for Netflix. But I was like... I was looking at what they released in Q2 versus Q3 and their argument. I know this is all spin on Netflix's part, but that just because it's spin doesn't mean it's necessarily untrue. And their Q2 hits are not nearly as appealing as their Q3 hits. In Q2, Dead to Me had 30 million viewers. Uh, When They See Us, the Ava DuVernay uh, film, 25 million. The Perfect Date had 48 million. And Always Be My Maybe had 32 million. Now, a lot of you are probably saying, what are those? Again, I think I remember the Ava DuVernay thing, but the other three, uh, maybe, maybe not. Here's what's coming up a coming quarter. Stranger Things season three is in this quarter. Uh, The final season of Orange is the New Black. Ozark season three. Jerry Seinfeld's Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee. The Dark Crystal, Age of Resistance, as well as the comedy specials from Aziz Ansari, Whitney Cummings, Catherine Ryan. Uh, Original films include The Irishman from Martin Scorsese, and movie Six Underground, directed by Michael Bay, starring Ryan Reynolds. So I don't think Q2 and Q3 even compare as far as original content goes. Yeah, and I think that there is, and, and Tom uh, and Roger and I were talking about this before the show, the the narrative of, well, Netflix is about to lose a lot of people who just watch it to watch reruns, pretty much, because those reruns are going to go to um, NBC Universal and Warner and Disney Fox's new upcoming SVOD services. And that's true. It, that will happen in some capacity, but it does seem like Q2 was a little bit of a, yeah, I mean, I, I watched all, Always Be My Maybe, a good movie. Uh, but it was it was a little bit of a lull in the content spike that you see coming up in Q3. I mean, yeah. Stranger Things alone, that's a, that's a, it's a big deal for a lot of folks. The Q2 stuff was good stuff that probably kept you as a Netflix subscriber if you liked it. Uh, the Q3 stuff is the kind of stuff that could bring people back to Netflix. Yeah. Uh, like, oh, you know what? I really want to watch that Dark Crystal. I can absolutely see that. And Netflix says that when it drops its catalog content, like stuff like Friends, it sees members shift to other content rather than drop subscriptions. Uh, people have been saying this since stars left Netflix years ago that, oh, when they lose their third party, their subscriptions are going to go down and it never has. So just be, you know, stop clock is right twice a day, right? Just because this is yeah. the time where a threatened departure of content that hasn't actually happened uh, was at the same time as a subscriber dip. I don't match those two up. Uh, first of all, the content's still there. Why would you cancel your subscription when it hasn't even disappeared yet? Uh, I don't think most people pay attention enough to, to think that far ahead. The, if they were going to cancel, they'd cancel when it disappeared. And Netflix says, you know, people have been saying this about us for a long time, which is why we started doing original content. Generally, people just find something else to watch. Yeah. And the key for Netflix is, do they have that something else? And if you look at Q2, not they didn't have it as much as they will in Q3. 
and that's going to happen with with any service uh that 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 just is what Netflix's Q2 was. And I think that, yeah, it's it's interesting that, at least for myself, there are times where, especially when I'm talking about content, like let's talk about The Office, right? Or Friends, which, which are very, very popular on Netflix. Most of the time that is nostalgic watching because people have already seen the show and they just kind of want to have it on. And there have been times in the past where I'm like, you know, maybe I'm on Hulu or Netflix or or, or, or some similar service where I'm like, eh, where'd it go? Eh, I don't know. I'll just watch something else because it's kind of background stuff. Now, I'm not saying that you're not going to Netflix to watch Friends specifically because you might be doing that. But I think that the the company has a point that in many cases, you're just sort of looking to put something on yeah. and you're going to find something else that is in the catalog. You know, I take it back. I guess The Office did leave, but I don't think it left till late in the quarter, if not in Q3. So again, I don't think that has as big an impact as people think. A bigger deal is choice. People are deciding, you know what? I, I'm i not watching that much on Netflix now. Maybe I'll stop it down and watch Hulu. Maybe I'll watch Prime Video. Maybe I'll watch mm -hmm. PlayStation View. Maybe I'll watch CBS All Access. Maybe I won't watch anything. Maybe I'll just buy some stuff and rent it. Maybe I'll play some video games. I mean, this market is getting saturated and it would be unthinkable for Netflix not to see any kind of impact from that. Uh, they also say that they saw a bigger advance in subscriptions in Q1 than they expected, and maybe that impacted Q2. Mm -hmm. uh, that's possible as well. I I think uh, people just, uh, they always want to jump the gun and say, this is it. This is finally the time that Netflix is crashing. Uh, if we see them miss their expectations again next quarter, then it's time to say, okay, maybe they are doing something wrong. And I will always be looking at their originals to be like, are their originals compelling enough? Maybe The Dark Crystal ends up not being that good. I I, I don't think it will. But you know, if, if we have a series of like, ooh, Orange is the New Black wasn't that great. Dark Crystal was a disappointment. Then you might start see people dropping off more often. But I think it's going to be more about the originals than the library content. Well, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. There are lots of cord cutting stories there and other tech news as well. You can be one of those people by submitting a story and voting on others and bringing them to our attention at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Join our group if you haven't already. Facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. All right, let's check out the mailbag. We got an email from Nick who said, I heard your podcast yesterday. That would have been Wednesday's show. I thought I'd chime in on the Amazon Choice discussion. When you see Amazon Choice, when you're when you're when you're searching for a product on Amazon. Nick says, I've sold them for over five years. There are two types of Amazon Choice. Number one, certain categories such as networking that Amazon will bid out to top vendors in the space to hit certain price points. They'll have them compete against each other to find the best value for a particular price band. They don't validate that it actually works best, just that the specs and price line up with what they want. Number two, Amazon will algorithmically generate an Amazon's choice for almost every search that you make. It's decided based on a combination of run rate, reviews, return rates, and a variety of other factors. With that said, they do tend to lean towards the cheap option, which is almost always an Amazon basic option as well. So there is an algorithm trying to generate the Amazon choice based on what they think is the best choice, but yeah. then they, in certain cases, just sell it. <laughs> so it's not always the same thing. That's annoying. Uh, I don't like that. Thank you, Nick, though, for the insight. Yeah. And Michael absolutely. sent in a screenshot of Open Sky, the app from Alphabet subsidiary Wing, designed to serve as air traffic control for drones. Uh, if you uh, look, the uh, red means no fly at all in the app. Orange means fly with conditions, uh, the condition to be aware that there is a private helipad nearby, uh, for instance. Uh, so you don't want to stray too far into that. You don't want to stray into that space. You want to be aware that that's nearby. So there's limits. Uh, so thank you for, for, for opening that up, Michael, and, and sending us the screenshot. That's awesome. Yeah. At the same time, I looked at it and I was like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> there's a lot of information here. I'd be afraid to fly a drone. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, this is why uh, Joe, the pilot, uh, <laughs> said, just let them all crash into each other and stay out of my way while I'm flying my plane. <laughs> right. As long as you don't crash in my backyard. Come away from me. That's Old right. man yells at chair. Uh, thanks, everybody, including our patrons, because you know what? You rock. Yes, they do. 
Thank you for supporting us. Uh, Keith Womack is among the many fine people who have supported this show directly for five years or more. Join Keith at patreon.com slash DTNS and tell us what you think of the show. We want your opinion. If you haven't taken our survey already, uh, it helps us improve the show. It's just a few questions about like, well, if we change this, would you hate it? Would you love it? Would you care? Dailytechnewsshow.com slash survey. Hey, did you guys hear the good word? We have an email address. That mm. email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com and we want to hear from you. We're also live Monday through Friday. If you can join us live, that would be great. 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Put it on your calendar and find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Patrick Norton. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>